A road trip needs a partner. Places to see. I see. I see. Well, George is sticking out there real big. Mm -hmm. And the road to get there. If your road trip is as long as the one my sister Julie and I just finished, from St. Louis. To the Pacific Coast, along the route of the Lewis and Clark expedition in the early 1800s. It'll include a healthy helping of tedium. Fun in Omaha. More tedium. And the beginning of a new appreciation of the vastness and variety of America the Beautiful. December 1803, just five months before the Lewis and Clark expedition headed up the Missouri River from St. Louis, the town was part of a huge French territory called Louisiana. President Thomas Jefferson bought Louisiana from France for $15 million, and he wanted Captains Meriwether Lewis and William Clark to explore it. Nearly two million people live today in this city at the junction of the United States' two largest rivers, the Mississippi and the Missouri. Fewer than 2,000 people lived there when Lewis and Clark set out with their group of about 40 volunteer soldiers. Both Lewis and Clark served as appointed territorial governors after their expedition returned to St. Louis in 1806 having traced the Missouri to its source in Montana, crossed the Rocky Mountains, and reached the Pacific Coast via the Columbia River. Clark and many of his descendants are buried in this plot in St. Louis Bellefontaine Cemetery. Two members of the Nez Perce tribe, Black Eagle and Speaking Eagle, who helped the expedition over Idaho's Bitterroot Mountains and years later visited Clark in St. Louis, are buried and remembered by this monument in Calvary Cemetery down the street from the Clark family. The Gateway Arch, opened in 1967, stands in a national park that commemorates the Louisiana Purchase. The expansion of the new United States across North America, which the purchase enabled, and the explorers sent by Jefferson, who engaged the native inhabitants of this new territory and brought back information about what the country had acquired. The Great Plains, which Lewis and Clark crossed using the Missouri River, are wide as the sky, just as they were at the beginning of the 19th century but they're also very different. The American bison, buffalo, that once numbered in the tens of millions are mostly gone. So are the native peoples who depended on them. Those disappearances are related. Less than 30 years after Lewis and Clark's trek, the U.S. Army launched a campaign to kill the buffalo, part of a government policy designed to reduce the Native American population and open land to white homesteaders. The river itself is different, the result of six dams that have turned the upper two-thirds of its length into a chain of long lakes. The plains today are carpeted by cultivated crops, not native grasses. 
yet the plain's vastness survives, punctuated by the occasional town, historical marker to Lewis and Clark's passage, or remembrance of the disappeared. We encountered our first statue commemorating Lewis and Clark in Kansas City's Case Park, built on a bluff overlooking the Missouri where the expedition camped. Another spot was outside Sioux City, Iowa, where the only expedition member to perish, Sergeant Charles Floyd, is buried near the spot where he died. It's believed he succumbed to a burst appendix. At Chamberlain, South Dakota, where we crossed the Missouri on Interstate 90, we encountered the massive Dignity statue. It's a 50-foot tall stainless steel image of a Native American woman who stands high above the river at a point where Lewis and Clark camped. Dignity of earth and sky, the statue's inscription says. It took two days to cross the Great Plains from St. Louis to the southwestern corner of South Dakota, where the landscape first begins to noticeably rise. That's where the national parks and monuments that inspired this trip begin. The Badlands and Mount Rushmore in South Dakota, Devil's Tower and Yellowstone in Wyoming, Glacier in Montana. Lewis and Clark never saw these places, although they found the source of the Missouri River at Three Forks, Montana, as well as tributaries that started in Yellowstone and Glacier. But we wanted to see the parks because of our ancestors who preceded us on this road. The sights they saw are icons of the American West. The Bad Lands and Lazily Grazing Pronghorn in Badlands National Park. The presidents of Mount Rushmore. I mean, I don't know how many years ago my grandmother saw this. Mm -hmm. I just think about that. The prairie dogs and Hollywood majesty of Devil's Tower. Yellowstone, where the last of the wild buffalo still roam. Creation still smolders. The canyon inspires and Old Faithful faithfully performs. Glacier, where the moose and the mountain goat still play. And the mountains divide Atlantic from Pacific, buffalo from salmon. Until Lewis and Clark the white Americans who were spilling westward from their original colonies were only dimly aware of the existence of these mountains. Thomas Jefferson's hope was that they would prove to be no more of a barrier to east-west commerce than the Appalachians had been. In fact, Lewis and Clark had great difficulty crossing the Rockies and would not have made it without the help of the native people who lived there. Transportation technology first railroads and later roads and cars ultimately would prove to be the solution to crossing these mountains not river transportation as Jefferson believed. Other than Lewis and Clark's 
no name cropped up more frequently on our road trip than Sacagaweas. She joined the expedition with her husband and just-born son at Mandan in what's now North Dakota, where the expedition spent its first winter in 1804-05. According to journals kept by several expedition members, she saved some of their papers and scientific equipment when a canoe overturned. She found edible plants and provided guidance in the Three Forks region, which she recognized as the place where she was kidnapped by the Hidatsa tribe from the Shoshone tribe when she was a child. Her greatest contribution, however, may have simply been being a Native American woman traveling in a party of armed white men. Her presence reassured tribes that the expedition's purpose was peaceful. When the expedition entered Shoshone territory in what's now Idaho, the chief of one band turned out to be Kamiohwe, either her brother or cousin, who donated horses so the expedition could pack its supplies over the Rocky Mountains. After crossing the Rockies, the expedition's route to the Pacific was with the current of the Snake and Columbia Rivers, downhill not uphill as it had been against the current of the Missouri River from St. Louis to Montana. The Columbia is much different from what it was two centuries ago. Dams have submerged the dangerous rapids and waterfalls the expedition had to pass. But it still flows through a beautiful 80-mile gorge up to 4,000 feet deep along the Oregon-Washington border before reaching the city of Portland and soon after the Pacific Ocean. There, at a fort the expedition built and named for the local Clatsop tribe, we reached the end of the Lewis and Clark Trail. But there were three sergeants on the Corps of Discovery, so this would have been a jacket that they left Missouri with a jacket like this. Now, it's very unlikely they still would have had any of them by the time they got here yeah. at Fort Clatsop. Having a jacket like this, not all that accurate for what they would have looked like while they were here. They would have been head to toe in buckskin, mm -hmm. or maybe had a frock like Sal's here. Mm -hmm. Yes, made of an old tent. Yeah. yeah. So there's a lot of repurposing going on, or like the hat, this yeah, fatigue yeah, hat, like made out of an old <laughs> uh -huh. coat. Along with Emily, my wife, and Maureen, our friend. They joined Julie and me in Portland for the final leg. We tacked on a drive through Mount Rainier National Park and a couple of days in Seattle as our celebration.